Ultimately, we have no need for nuclear power. The planet Earth is afloat in a sea of cosmic electric power, the same power that powers the sun, together with all the stars in the universe. Once we get the political barriers out of the way, technologies will be developed for the utilization of this self-renewing and near-boundless energy resource. The present political barriers that also exist in the sciences prevent the very recognition that this resource exists, but those barriers are artificial and can therefore be dealt with. Whether we can rescue ourselves from the effects of the coming ice age depends on our willingness to use these abundantly existing materials and the vast nuclear and cosmic power potential that we have on hand. The capability that these give us could have been utilized for 50 years already by society to upgrade its living, such as providing the much-needed free universal housing as a means to end homelessness, slum living, rent slavery, and so on. So far, however, nothing has been done along this line, mostly because of the still prevailing narrow-minded thinking in society. Thus the vast potential that we have on hand right now to upgrade our world remains as dormant as it had been for 50 years already. The present trend of non-response might very well continue and block our preparation for the coming Ice Age transition as the materials and power resources that could prevent the greatest disaster in human history from occurring remain on the ground and in the skies unused. Tragically, almost all nations react in the same manner. The deck and traps in India, for example, contained almost four times as much basalt than the Columbia River flood basalt province in the USA. Sadly however, India has no plans for utilizing any of it. And even the giant deck and traps in India are nevertheless small in comparison with the still larger flood basalts in Russia. Called the Siberian traps, that Russia likewise has no plans for massive utilization. The same can be said about all the rest of the similar flood basalt provinces around the world. While basalt is relatively rare, there exists enough of it on the surface of the Earth to cover the entire land area of our planet 36 feet deep. In some cases, as in the Siberian traps, the basalt is piled 6,000 feet high. There is vastly more of this excellent material available around the world than we'll ever be able to use or need to use to build the various structures that will enable the present world population to remain unaffected by the coming Ice Age. If the Ice Age preparations are not made, 80% of the world population will likely not survive the transition into the next glaciation period, or none at all if wars erupt over the dwindling food resources and living spaces. No one can live without food or survive in an ice world. The building of basalt-based infrastructures gives humanity the capability to avoid the impending devastation that the return of the Ice Age will bring to many areas, provided that society cares to use its capability to build what is needed to escape this fate. Thus the question of to be or not to be will be answered by our willingness to cooperate globally to use the potential that we have at hand to bypass the Ice Age impact on human living. Great extinctions have occurred throughout the history of life on our planet, each for its own cause. The only commonality that unites them all is the inability of the non-human species to protect themselves from radical changes in their environment, such as long-extended ice ages. Deep cutting environment changes are normal occurrences in the context of the numerous galactic resonance cycles that affect our climate. But humanity's knowledge of this and an ever greater understanding of the science involved can enable us to uplift our world with such economic and technological power that the resulting renaissance will render the worst environmental changes, such as the coming ice age, to have no effect on human living. Extinction events simply have no natural place in the history of the human journey. Animal species are bound to a fate of living and dying with the strength of their environment. This fate has been fatal on many occasions. But the human species has the capacity to sidestep this fate and create its own environment. Still one question remains here. Are we willing to utilize our capacity for scientific understanding and develop it further and move with it? This, at the present time, is entirely a political question.
On the political scene the future looks presently dark, and intentionally so, as it is becoming increasingly evident. The British author H.G. Wells would comment, if he was alive today, this is necessary for the good of the empire. He probably has said this on many occasions in his time. He certainly has said, so in his novels, indirectly, such, as in his 1895 novel, The Time Machine. Wells never spoke of global warming. Of course. This scam hadn't been invented that far back. It is a recent invention, though built on the platform that he laid out in his novel, The Time Machine, to serve as a diversion. There is nothing real about global warming except its purpose, and this purpose is to keep humanity's eyes closed to the danger and the reality of the impending return of the Ice Age glaciation. Wells' prime political doctrine was to choke science in order to prevent the normal development of humanity. The modern global warming hoopla expresses directly this doctrine that Wells had laid out in 1895 within the story of his novel of a time traveler. In the novel a machine was built that enables its operator to be transposed in time far into the future. There he encounters the Aloy, a society of small, peaceful, elegant, childlike people. They live in small communities within large and futuristic buildings that were deteriorating. They were doing no work. They had no need for it. Their world was rich with fruits of all sorts. When the traveler's time machine becomes stolen, he searches for it and encounters the Morlocks, an ape, like people who live underground and surface only at night. The traveler discovers in their dwellings the industrial machinery that makes the above-ground paradise possible. As he searches their tunnels for his time machine, he discovers the relationship between the two people, learning that the Morlocks, the machine people, feed on the Aloy, which they keep as livestock for their nourishment. H.G. Wells' novel The Time Machine appears to be designed as a wake-up call for the empire's oligarchy, the leisured class, that has become the ineffectual Aloy, while the downtrodden working classes, the intelligent, science-driven machine people, have become the masters of the world. His message to the oligarchy was, which was understood, that if you don't wake up and curb the advance of science and technology in the world and prevent society's development, those primitive working classes will eat you for breakfast in the near future. Herbert George Wells, 1866-1946, wasn't alone of course in warning the empire's oligarchy to prevent scientific and technological progress by all means possible. The Fabian Society was already leaning in this direction, which he respected for it, though Wells found the Fabians to be not radical enough. He had high praise for Joseph Stalin, a real, effective, radical man. The Fabian Society adopted the name of the Roman general Quintus Fabius Maximus. Fabius earned his fame with his defense of Rome against the vastly superior forces of the Carthaginians when Hannibal invaded Italy. Without a hope of winning, Fabius refused a direct confrontation, while he kept his troops close to Hannibal's army, to harass and exhaust them in a long war of attrition, limiting Hannibal's ability to fight while conserving his own military force. The delaying tactics involved a scorched-earth type policy that prevented Hannibal's forces from obtaining grain and other resources. Eventually Hannibal retreated from Italy. The scorched earth lesson of Quintus Fabius Maximus inspired the empire's oligarchy in its war against the rising Renaissance spirit of humanity. In admiring Fabius' strategy it adapted his name as the Fabian Society. Over the years the Fabian objective became the platform of a number of organizations with different names by which the objective became implemented on a broad front and continues so to the present. Here we find the connection between Wells, the Fabian ideology, and the global warming scam with the return of the Ice Age, on the near horizon. The return of the Ice Age demands a worldwide scientific and technological renaissance to protect the world's agriculture against the returning deep cold climate. No empire, no matter how mighty, would be able to withstand the humanist power of this renaissance, the masters of the modern empire understand this reality perfectly and evidently saw no way to avoid the consequence except by preventing it from happening. Thus the global warming scam was designed to block humanity's move towards the renaissance that would end the rule of empire.
the scan was designed to block especially scientific and technological development. That's the Wellsium platform, the global warming scan has also a Fabian component, which is the scorched earth policy of genocide. Under the global warming umbrella the most devastating global holocaust is presently carried out that silently claims up to 100 million victims per year under the dictum of imperial demands that take food out of the mouths of a starving humanity for it to be burned. The amount of farmland and resources that are presently devoted globally to growing the feedstock for ethanol and biodiesel would normally produce sufficient food for more than 100 million people. In a world where a billion people live in chronic starvation, the consequences for massively burning food under the global warming umbrella adds up to a global holocaust that dwarfs the gruesome Nazi holocaust into insignificance. The biofuels have no other purpose than genocide. With rare exceptions, they are not net energy producer nor a reducer of pollution, but are effective in causing genocide. The genocide is evidently intended to weaken society to prevent human development, a typical Fabian objective. The brutality that is deemed necessary also increases the impression in society that global warming is real, for which genocidal sacrifices must be made, thereby instilling the belief that the real danger, the return of the Ice Age, does not exist. Wells would be happy with the modern Fabians now being sufficiently radical, though the term Radical is carefully avoided in the political world. What used to be called radical is now called making difficult choices or hard choices, and genocide is called in modern terminology demographic adjustment or population reduction. In the shadow of this false speak, the return of the Ice Age, that is never spoken of, which is a great and real danger for us all, drifts far out of sight. Global warming appears to have been designed from the start as a genocide project for the purpose of preventing a grand new renaissance from taking off in response to the growing awareness in the scientific community in the early 1970s of the great challenge that the impending return of the Ice Age presents to humanity. The masters of empire evidently saw this trend as a great threat to their power, which every renaissance in history was. They finally acted in 1974 to not only prevent it from taking off, but to overturn it so completely that the very notion of an Ice Age Renaissance would never be raised again. The project for this became the Global Warming Doctrine. The year 1974 was the year in which a number of other genocidal projects were started. One of these was the American NSSM 200 policy that called for radical population reduction throughout the Third World. It was designed to prevent human development, with the excuse to prevent the use of raw materials, in the Third World, that the Master's Empire aimed to preserve for their own future needs. The global warming doctrine has become widely used to not only prevent Third World development, but to cause depopulation by poverty and diseases. AIDS erupted four years after an SSM 200 became an official part of U.S. policy. The policy became later universally applied against any form of economic development worldwide, forging the stage of de-industrialization, leading into the post-industrial era of increasing poverty, misery, hopelessness, punctuated by wars 